Thank you. Thank you for being here to start the second half of our first day at Write the Docs. I would like to thank Write the Docs for giving me the opportunity to speak up here. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Today we're going to talk about how previous roles in technology, or maybe not in technology, can help you in your writing career. It's important to value a winding path. Some of us start in tech writing right out of school, and some of us, like me, and I would imagine many of you, start a tech writing later in your career, and you probably did a few things between school and leading up to that tech writing experience. I'm going to talk about four of the roles that I've had leading into being a technical writer. And I want to be clear that just because I'm talking about roles that I've had, that doesn't mean that they're more important than any of the roles you've had. They're simply what I know, so that's what I'm going to talk about. My hope is that if you happen to have done these, maybe you'll be able to get some information from them that can help you. Maybe you can visualize some of the things I'm talking about that can help you. And maybe they can trigger some memories and other things you've done that can help you in your writing career. Now, because I'm going to talk about some of the things I'm do I've done, I'm going to give you a really quick background about how I got to where I am. I started off in school with an English degree. I loved it. I loved reading. I loved writing. I loved literature. And I thought that's what I was going to do with the rest of my life, get a master's and probably teach. But not long after leaving college, I landed in technology completely by accident. And that was an amazing thing. It kind of fused the best of both worlds because I discovered I love technology and I also like to write. It's important to value the circuitous journey that can take you into technical writing. A few years ago, I had this experience where I was a project manager. That was the last thing I did prior to becoming a writer. And when I was a project manager, I really enjoyed the job but it could be a little bit stressful. And I was mid-career, wondering if that's really what I wanted to continue doing. So I thought to myself, what could be next? And then I remembered that English degree and how much I enjoyed it. And I also remembered doing some amateur writing in my 20s when I had a lot more time on my hands. And then I pictured myself with a business card that had the word writer on it, and being at a social function and saying, I'm a writer. And then, of course, doing the actual writing. And that overwhelmed me with a wave of calm. It seemed like the right thing to do, but the big question is, how do I take what I've done and turn it into doing what I'm lucky enough to be doing right now? So that first role in technology was working in technical support. Someone suggested I apply for a role. I thought it was a silly thing to suggest with no technical experience. I was able to convince them that I had the communication skills to help customers and the aptitude to learn the rest. And when I think back on that experience, as a writer, the biggest takeaway is the customers. When you are in any support role or in any role with the customer, you are dealing with the people who are using your product, and you are also dealing with the people who are writing what you are reading what you are writing. And that's a really important takeaway. In support, you get to deal with the emotional customer. And when I say emotional, that's another word for angry. <laughs> we had to deal with customers who were, they were venting so hard, sometimes it felt like you could feel the spittle come out of the mouthpiece <laughs> into which you're talking. You could picture someone on the other end of the phone with their face so beet red. But the thing to remember is, they're calling you because they ran into a problem. Whether it's because they didn't understand something or they found a legitimate bug, they are frustrated. And when you deal with these people, you learn how to deal with them with professionalism. You le learn how to speak with them with confidence. You learn how to empathize. And those are things that you can apply directly to your writing. Maybe not so much to how you write, but to what you write to help prevent people like this from calling. And also, if you're dealing with these people in tech support, chances are high you might be doing it in a written format. Say you're replying to emails from people who are venting and writing less than kind things, but you learn how to write back in a professional way. That's something you can apply to being a writer. You deal with some of the confused customers or the newer customers. These might be customers who don't necessarily have a passion for the software that you are writing about, but it's software that was given to them as a tool. And their, say their boss says, I want you to get X done. And so they go to work. They 
consult your documentation, and they get a little bit lost. As an example, back in the 90s when I was working in the Windows 3.1 days, I had a customer call, and this person wasn't very technically savvy, but this person did run into a legitimate issue. So, like other technicians, I walked this person into what they considered the innards of the operating system, getting into the autoexec.bat and the windows.ini and backing them up. And I'm with this person at the DOS prompt, and I would say, okay, type this. And they would, and I'd say, what does it say? And they'd tell me, and I'd say, okay, now, now do this. Does it say that? Yes. And we would do this, and eventually this person paused and said, can, can you see my screen? <laughs> and the point here is that we're writing for people who may not be the most technically savvy people, and they may want to get that one thing that your software is known for doing done. And you want to make sure that when you write that, you write it in a clear way. I had another customer call, and no matter where they put their cursor on the screen, the cursor would always scroll to the right. So we spent about five minutes trying to diagnose this, and this person wasn't untechnical. And all of a sudden, he paused, and he said, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. He had a book resting on his keyboard on the space button. So this helps demonstrate the humanity of the people that we write for. They're humans just like us. They're our friends, our family, and you need to keep that in mind when you're doing your writing. And of course, you have to deal with the power user. These are the ones who are confident. They're the ones who will take your software as far as it can go. They'll call you with a legitimate issue, but they have no problem making you think they know more than you do. And they very well may. When you deal with these people, you learn how to speak with confidence and clarity and accuracy. You don't want to try to fake it with these people. Same with writing. You don't want to fake it in your writing. If there's some details that need to be put in there, make sure they're there so that these power users who really want to get into the depths of the software that you're writing about can do so. So to summarize, in the support experience, you learn how to empathize with the customers and the different issues that they run into. Do your best with your writing to prevent those issues from coming up. You learn how to relate to the customer. You can relate with them. You can relate with the angry or the people who may be a little bit confused or may not know technology very well. Try to put this into the writing to make sure that you address as many audiences for your software as possible. And the biggest takeaway is, in support, you're helping the customer. And there's a huge amount of satisfaction in doing that in support, as well as writing. Now, after support, I decided that rather than help the people who use the software, maybe I could write the software. And the next step in that journey was to move into quality assurance, where I would find these cute little bugs and try to kill them. Because I wanted to move into software development, I wanted to do some automated testing. So I let my manager know this, and being a good manager, he decided to assign me one of the more complicated pieces of the software that I was testing. And that had to do with these connectors that you see. And these connectors are glued to the shapes, and when you move the shapes, the connectors reroute, and the important thing is the connectors don't go through the shapes, and when they jump each other, they have those nice little jumps. So I walked into the office of the person who was writing all this. He was an amazingly smart person. And I said, hi, uh, my name's Mark. I'm here to test your software for the next version. His first response was, where's Andy? <laughs> well, Andy's been moved to another piece of the software. I'm going to be testing this for this version. Well, I want Andy back. Andy knows this stuff. Why do we need to teach someone else new about this? Well, I don't make those decisions, but I'm really excited to learn about what you do, and hopefully we can work together. So he took me by his side, and for the next couple weeks and months, I started to learn all about these connectors. Now, he visualized these connectors as little streams. And what I quickly learned was this guy, not only was he extremely smart, and maybe a little bit prickly, but he also had a very subtle sense of humor. And he decided to name the different algorithms that determined how these connectors would reroute after the fish that go through the streams. So he had algorithms like the trout algorithm and the cod algorithm and the halibut algorithm. And as you can imagine, from someone who's trying to integrate with those APIs, 
that really doesn't help a whole lot. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make with this is that in a testing environment, especially if you're doing white box testing and have to get into the APIs, you need to be able to understand these really complex concepts. And you need to be able to work with the people who write that software, who may not be people people. As a writer, you have to do the same thing. You need to be able to understand what you're writing about well enough to document it to help the people who are using your software. And you need to work with people who do this, and it's important to be able to develop those relationships. And if you have that experience in other roles, it'll help you have that experience when you move into writing or as a writer if you already are one. Another thing you do in test is you learn how to write procedures. Now, when I'm thinking of procedures, I'm thinking of the user interface. So you might click on the file menu, choose print or file menu, choose options, and take the customer from point A, which might be choosing a menu, to an end result, the reason they actually went to your software. And you need to do that in a crisp and clear way so the customer doesn't get confused when they go from that point A so they can get their end result done using your writing. Now, in test, those are called bug reports. If you find a bug, you need to make sure that when you write that bug report for the engineer, it's crisp and clear, describes exactly what needs to be done, describes the end result, which is probably the bug, and describes what should work. If you have that experience in a role such as test, that's something you can apply directly to your role as a writer. One of the funnest things about being in test is breaking the software. Now, of course, as a writer, you don't want to break the software. But you want to think like someone who might be trying to break the software. You want to try to think about the software and try to evaluate where some of the weak spots are and ensure that those are covered well in your documentation. Think about the fact that if you are in a test role, you are the first person to use this. You're the first customer before it ever goes into the wild. Use that mentality as a writer to think about what you should cover in your documentation. Maybe there are some well-known bugs. You could put those in an FAQ or a troubleshooting section. It's a good mindset for the writer to have to ensure that some of the pitfalls that may be available in the software that's released in the wild is documented well and the customers don't, don't get tripped up and you help our friends in tech support get less calls. To summarize the test experience, both the tester and the writer is trying to make the customer happy by either sending out software that has a few bugs or writing documentation that helps the customer do their job well. You learn how to dive deep into software, and you learn how to develop relationships with those people who write the software and create the software that you're documenting. You learn how to write steps clearly and concisely as a, when you're writing the bug reports. Do the same thing when you're describing UIs or any other sort of procedure that gets a customer from a point A to a final point B where they cross the finish line and achieve what it is they want to your documentation to do. And you get to be the customer. Think about trying to break the software. Think about what a customer is experiencing when they go to your software and do your best to make sure that what they're reading, that is the content you're creating, is good to help them use it well. So following the test experience, I moved into software engineering. I was lucky to get a junior software degree, or degree, <laughs> junior software role. And it's here where there's a lot of gold that may seem a little bit obvious to this audience, but it's definitely worth mentioning. If you are a software engineer, you know coding concepts that can help you greatly as a writer. They can help you gain confidence with the people that are writing the software, help you develop those relationships internally, and they can help you when you write for the customers who are also very technical. You know things like what a loop is and a function and a, and a variable and a class, object-oriented programming. These are all terms that you can work with with confidence and with ease because it's something that you, work, you have experience doing. One thing to remember is that coders also write. <laughs> So it's the good developers who write good code, but it's the great ones who write good comments. It's the comments that help people, like future engineers, know what you were trying to do, or even yourself, 
Sometimes you go back to code you wrote a year ago, and if you don't put in good comments, you might scratch your head and wonder, what, what, was I mean, what did I mean there? If you can document the code at that level of detail, you can apply that to the writing that you do. Also consider the fact that coders have to write specifications, design documents, and all sorts of other types of writing internally that might be used by marketing or product managers. Use that writing experience as a writer to help make the writing for your customers as good as possible. Of course, if you're an engineer or software developer, you know at least one coding language. Most are C-based, and if you know one, you can understand most. This helps you write sample code. This helps you write about the code with confidence, and it's a wonderful asset to have as a writer. As an engineer, you have to write clearly. The water here is supposed to demonstrate how clearly you can write either code or your documentation. And when I say writing code clearly, we've probably heard of spaghetti code. And that's code that looks like a jumbled mess. And it could work perfectly with no bugs. But you can also have the same code, or very similar code, in your compiler that looks almost like a work of art. It's perfectly designed and it's easy to read. It's concise and there's lots of white space. Think of that with your writing. You can write something that makes complete sense and is helpful to the customer. But if it's jumbled up in a user guide or difficult to follow, then a customer is going to get tired and they may abandon the writing or they may get frustrated. Consider things like white space in your writing. Think about spaces between paragraphs. Think about bullets, things like that that can help the writing that's already good be easier to comprehend. And of course, there's the relationship between the coder and the tester, which is directly analogous to the writer and the editor. If you've done the work as an engineer and worked with a coder, then it's a relationship you can enter into pretty easily when you become a writer and work with the editor. Of course, every writer thinks that what they write is perfect, and every coder who codes something thinks what they do is almost perfect, but you throw it over the fence, and then it comes back with all this markup. And if you can understand that they're there to help you make what you do better and develop that relationship, if you've done that in the engineering world, the transition to doing that in the writing world will be much, much easier. Another thing to think about if you've been an engineer or a software developer is that you can write classes and functions that work really, really well, but you still need to organize them in a way that makes sense. You want to make sure that your classes work well together to make everything as efficient as possible. You may have heard of design patterns. That's sort of what I have in mind here, but of course we don't have time to go into something that detailed. But you can apply that kind of thinking to a user guide. So this is a hypothetical case that I thought up, and if you can't read it very well, it's basically a table of contents on the left, and each arrow points to a class that's similar to the chapter that is in the table of contents. And in this case, it's a table of contents for a user guide with different printer languages. And I chose PCL, PostScript, and PDF, which prints to file. So in this case, you have a chapter that's an overview of all of the printer languages, a chapter on the methods in the printer languages, a, print, a chapter on the samples in the printer languages, and then say another printer language comes about. You want to make sure your user guide is extensible, and in this case, the red represents what would be new. So you would just add a new section to each chapter. Another way to think about it is to think of a base class that is a printer language. Think of that as the base class as a chapter. And in this case, rather than having chapters about overview, samples, etc., you might have a chapter about each different type of printer language. Each one of those will inherit the same, in this case, you could call them methods, but we're calling them subtopics in your chapter. So for the PDF class, you'll have an overview topic, methods topic, samples topic, same with the other printer languages. And if another one comes into being, you simply add a brand new chapter rather than appending to other chapters. Now, there's no right way to do this, but if you have this level of thinking, and this conceptualizing of a lot of data as an engineer, you can apply that to 
your user guide as it grows in size and ensure that you keep it as extensible as possible and also make sure that customers can find what they're looking for as easily as possible. In this case, it's likely that a customer only cares about one, pr one printer language at a time. Therefore, you'll have them grouped by chapters so they don't have to sift through all the other printer language stuff. That would just be a bunch of noise. But if they want to learn about them all at once, then the previous option might be the better one. It's up to the writer to try to think about what works best. So as a software engineer, some of the parallels between that role and the writing role is you can explain concepts well using detailed coding language. You can integrate code because you can write code. You can manipulate code that say some of your internal engineers give you to help you learn the software better. You can use that as a basis for sample code to put in your documentation. You can write clearly. Think about how you might make that function in that class as easy to read as possible. Try to do the same thing with your documentation. You can work with the editor well because you've already had a relationship like that with the tester. And you can design for access, which is what we were talking about just a moment ago. You can make sure that when a customer comes to your user guide, they can easily find what they want. Now, following the engineering role, I decided I wanted to work with people more, so I moved into the project management space. And here, the big thing you're working with is the triple constraint, which is scope, schedule, and cost. And that is documented in a statement of work. So this is a great piece of writing in another role that could be applied to the software tech role. In a statement of work, you have a business document, often legally binding, that specifies exactly what you are going to deliver. It specifies the scope of your deliverables, the price, the schedule, it might have dependencies. So there's very little room for ambiguity. You also want to put in there something like acceptance criteria. So when the project is over, you know when done is done. Use that level of non-ambiguity when you're writing a technical document. Make sure that when customers read it, they know exactly what you mean. If there's any room for confusion, fill in those holes the same way you have to do with the statement of work to ensure that you have happy stakeholders at the end of that project. Also as a project manager, you learn how to deliver status about your project, which isn't always easy. We all know that all projects are meant to go perfectly well, but you always have hiccups. And it's important during those times to be able to convey what's going on to your stakeholders. Sometimes you may run into an issue because something isn't going right. You might have a blocker. In writing, the same thing can happen. You might be documenting something, but you don't have the screenshots necessary to complete the documentation. If someone comes to you and says, how's the status of that going? Will we have it ready for the launch in two weeks? If something's wrong, you need to raise your voice and let them know. But if you've done this as a project manager, it's much easier to do as a writer because you have that experience and you can speak confidently and let people know what might be going on. One thing that a manager I had in project management said to me, which I think rings very true, is practice no surprise project management. The goal here is to have no surprises for your customers and your stakeholders. See if you can do the same thing as a writer. If something's going to go wrong, let people know early so you can course correct and readjust. Don't wait to the last minute to let someone know that your documentation for that feature is going to be late. You can use things like status reports. You can use the red, yellow, and green stoplight colors to help convey the status reports easily. The status re reports can also help you manage your own projects. Another thing about project management, if you can manage a project, this means you can manage your writing. And if you're somebody who's juggling a lot of different writing tasks at the same time, this can be really, really valuable. You can use software such as Asana or, sorry, Trello. If you're working independently, those are good ones to use. Or if you're working in a corporate environment, chances are really high you already have some sort of project management software or software to track your progress in-house. And I think it's important to try to use those. It really helps you prioritize what you want to do and 
know when to work on something to ensure that nothing gets left behind. It also helps you keep your stakeholders, who in this case are the people consuming your documentation, happy. So I use this image of a sunset because the idea of a sunsetting a successful project management project is one of the joys of project managing. To summarize the project manager role and how it can relate to our roles as technical writers, in project management you write business documents, such as statements of work. That writing is applicable to what you do as a project manager, I mean, as a technical writer, sorry. You have experience delivering status and being frank and upfront and letting people know what's going on without any fear of looking bad. Because if something's not going well, it's not always your fault. You just wanna make sure that people know so things can be done to remove any potential blockers that are preventing you from getting what you need to get done, done. And you can manage your work, which is a wonderful thing because that way it eases some of the stress on you because you know what you should be working on at any given time and it eases the stress of those who are dependent upon what you are delivering. So those are the four roles that helped me when I was going to move into the technical writing role. And as I thought back on them, the one thing they all have in common is that they're all there to help the customer. All roads lead to the customer. In support or any other customer facing role, it's your job to remove obstacles, help make the customer happy. In QA, your job is to help make the customer happy by helping to create software that is as bug free as possible. Of course, as an engineer, you're creating software that you think is gonna help the customer. And in project management, your customer in this case is more on the internal side, but they're also very, very important. They're your stakeholders, and they're the ones who you wanna make sure to keep happy so you can continue doing what you do. So if you've had other roles in the technical space prior to becoming a writer, then you understand software and you're able to describe it well. As our friend Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Well, if you've had these roles in the past, you can understand it well enough, which means you can explain it simply so our customers can read our documentation and get what they need to get done, done easily. Thank you. <laughs>